All right, let's see. All right, assalamu alaikum, everybody. Um, we are in our last, approaching the end of the, the second, third of Ramadan. So I hope I hope the first 20 days were really, um, really good for you all and that you are uh, anticipating the final 10 days to be even more beneficial. Um, welcome back to the Ramadan Halakha um, through Muslim Space. Uh, we are here with week three. And today we're joined by Dr. Hina Azam. And she is a professor at the University of Texas in Austin. She teaches courses in Islamic studies, such as Islamic theology, Islamic law, the Quran, and Quran interpretation, as well as Islamic feminism. Um, also teaches a course on comparative religions of the Middle East. Her research focuses on women, gender, sexuality in Islam, ethics, and pedagogy. She supervises or serves as a reader for undergraduate and graduate thesis and dissertations across the university. Uh, coincidentally, Dr. Azam was uh, Dr. Hakani's uh, advisor, correct, Dr. Azam? Yes, I was. I was her yes. doctoral supervisor. Yep. So uh, I'm very, I was very, I was very happy to see that you invited her and that she was able yeah. to come and share her. It was her, great. Her it, and I think having you then do the next two weeks is just a beautiful um, continuation. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Dr. Azam in just a moment. But I want to remind everybody that there will be an opportunity for Q&A after her presentation. But at any point, if there's something um, that you have a question on, feel free to drop it in the chat box. Uh, I'll be watching the chat box, um, and we'll also give you an opportunity to just raise your hand during the Q&A portion if you'd like to unmute and ask the question yourself. So without further ado, I'm going to mute myself and replace this. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Um, I don't know how uh, people feel about this, but if you feel like or would like to turn your cameras on, that would be lovely because then I feel like I'm speaking with people as opposed to black boxes. Um, so that would be lovely. And I think I recognize, I, of course, I know Tanya. And there's Zainab. And Roshnara, I, your face looks really familiar, but I don't recognize your name. So I don't know if I've met you before. You have met me at Zainab's once. Yeah. At Zainab's, okay, okay. I, I think you look familiar. <laughs> Um, and there's, oh, there's a second Tanya, that's Summer. <laughs> um, and welcome, um, Al Akhtar. I'm assuming it's Al and not AI, although these days AI is everywhere. So <laughs> one can never be sure. Um, great. So I am so delighted to be invited here. Uh, thank you so much to Sister Zainab and Shadia, um, because I have been sort of a peripheral participant in Muslim space for a long time and really admire the work that you all are putting into it and the community that you've built. Um, so, uh, and there is Shahnaz. I should say, Professor Shahnaz. Um, so, Shahnaz! <laughs> it's, it's my name. It, it, Professor Haqqani, it's so lovely to have you join us. <laughs> Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't attend your presentations, but I I hear they're great, and I'm I know they were great because you're Shahnaz, so of course they were. Great. <laughs> uh, so I'm so happy to be to to be here, and um, I'm going to put up my slides, and I'm not a super whiz at um, the PowerPoint and the Zoom all together, but hopefully I can make it work despite the fact that we do all sorts of um, online teaching now. Shanaz, are you still teaching online? Do you ever teach online, even though we're back in person? Uh, no, I just have the Pashto classes at UT that I'm teaching online. And I'm everything sure. else in person. Yeah, but right, so we're, we're, so we're, we're sort of forgetting how to do all yeah. this stuff because we're not doing it as regularly. Okay, um, so I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And so hopefully now you all should be able to see my slide. Oh, but you can also see you can also see us, right? Our faces. That's the sort of the downside. Okay. I like to see you all, but 
then you won't be able to see the slide. So I'm going to have to do this. Um, which means that I won't be able to see the chat unless I like pop out of here. So, and I, and I can't, I can't see any of you, sadly. Um, so I, uh, I'm really excited to talk with you about this topic, um, which is sort of another way of staying true to a law, staying, staying, staying true to God, because um, we oftentimes think of or are presented with the idea that to um, to be a good Muslim or to stay true to Allah or to have faith is about following the various rules of the Sharia. Um, but I've been very interested in sort of the ethical aspect, which I think probably is we're finding to be more common. Um, and so what I'm presenting today on is the ethical principles in the Quran. And what I've tried to do is sort of bring bring those verses together so that we can look at them, we can contemplate them, and maybe have a conversation about them. Um, I have to say, I don't like this fact that I can't see you all. So I, I might... I might pop out of here at some point just because. So um and Shadia, if you see questions coming into the chat that feel sort of like that I should address them right then, then will you just speak because I may not see it? Yep, will do. Okay, great. So um, so as I was saying, Muslims oftentimes focus on the specific rules of the Sharia. Um, and so we tend to think of the Sharia as just a, a collection of rules. Um, however, just as important in the Sharia and going all the way back to the Quran are what I think of, or I'm describing as general rules of virtuous of virtuous conduct, um, which we, we may call ethics. So um, the focus here is on the general rules. Rules. So it's not that ethics are not rules, they are rules, but they are not as specific um, or concrete. They are more general principles of how to behave well um, according to God. Um, so that is what I mean by ethics. And so those are also in the Quran, although they tend not to be as emphasized sometimes in some by some thinkers. So, um, so as I mentioned just now, when I refer to ethics, I'm discussing, I, I'm referring to those rules of good conduct that are more general rather than specific. But there's another thing that makes ethics ethics, and that is that ethics are more outwardly or socially oriented rather than individual inwardly or God oriented. Um, there's a whole set of concepts that have to do with the rights of God and the rights of persons that I don't want to go into. But um, if we think, for example, about something like praying, doing salat or fasting, then um, those are individual. They're something that we do by ourselves. We do them as part of our ibadah. Um, and those are specifically for God or for that personal individual relationship that we have with God. Or if we think, think of dhikr, right? Remembrance of Allah, that is something that is inward. Um or even if we think about like intention, um, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. One can sort of intend all sorts of things, but ultimately um, it's one's outward actions that affect others that um, that are really important to creating a just society. And so when I use the word ethics, um, and I should say that there's not exactly a word like ethics in the Quran, there are other words, and I'm going to introduce those that are used. I'm using the English word word ethics to sort of collect all of these ideas of rules, uh, this idea of rules that are general, that are socially oriented. So the important point here is that God calls upon us to act virtuously in our interactions with others and not only with him. So, right, Islam is not just about doing the various um, ritual forms of worship but it's also about how we how we behave with others. Oh, what happened? I have a repeat slide. Okay, so uh, in these two sessions today and next Saturday, I will reflect on two key organizing principles of Quranic ethics. As I mentioned just a moment ago, there's no word ethics in the Quran or 
exactly, but there are other key terms. So I'm going to focus on two. The first of those is ihsan, um, which is literally doing good, but could also be thought of as beneficence if we look at sort of ethical theory um, in like Western scholarship, but there's this idea of beneficence or maleficence. So beneficence is doing good. Um, and so the word for that is ihsan. And many of you who are Urdu speakers or Arabic speakers or Persian speakers are familiar with this word ihsan. Um, and we'll e might even recognize the root um, ha sin alif hasan, which is, means goodness or good. Uh, the second key term is that of balance or justice. And there are two words that uh, are found in Arabic that refer to what we call justice. One is adala or adil, um, and the second is qist. So adala and qist are slightly different. Uh, both of them can be thought of as justice in the Quran. Uh, in English, I mean, and they are sort of used interchangeably, uh, slightly different focuses, but sort of interchangeably in the Quran. Um, Adala has to do with balance. Like if you think of, you know, a load, uh, uh, it actually comes from the idea of a load on a camel or on a donkey or an animal of, the, of that nature. Um, so if we think of um, balancing the load so that the animal can actually walk in a effective and constructive manner, then that is adala. Um, so one way that uh, the ancients thought of adala is the idea that um, each, each thing has its place. Each person has their role. Um, so when everybody acts effectively in their capacity, in their role towards the collective good, then we have Adala. So that's one part of justice. The other is qist, which I translate as equity. And um, qist has more to do with securing of rights. So let's say that something is out of balance, <clears throat> that something is out of balance. The adala has been thrown off. And then we have a situation where one person doesn't um, doesn't it, it doesn't have the the equity that they that they should um or there's not the equity that there should be so qis is sort of the redressing of the imbalance um through equity in order to restore that so the two ideas go together and we oftentimes call that uh, refer to that combined concept as justice in english So I want to start with ihsan. Um, again, this is literally beneficence or doing good. And the first thing that I want to do in this presentation is establish that ihsan actually is a value in the Quran. Um, and we'll go into what it means a little bit later. But first, we have to show that it actually is as important as it is, that it is something that God calls us to do. So this presentation of mine is really Quran focused. And so the majority of what you will see on the screen is translation of verses from the Quran. I don't have a lot of tafsir. I don't have fiqh. I don't have other things. It's very Quran centric, although there is one hadith that I threw in there. Um, so the first verse here is uh, spend of your substance for the sake of God and do not make your own hands contribute to your destruction. Rather do good for Allah loves those who do good. So that is sort of, this This verse is one of the most direct um, commands to do good. And the fact that God loves those who do good. And this is kind of a, a kind of an aspect of Quranic discourse that oftentimes, instead of saying do something, it will say God loves who those who do such and such. So that is interpreted as well, we should do that because we, we want to do things that God loves. Okay, here's another example uh, of a verse that just identifies or establishes that it is critical to do ihsan. So um, 
I actually love this verse. Um, serve God and do not join any partners with him and do good to parents, kinfolk, orphans, those in need, neighbors who are near, neighbors who are strangers, the companion by your side, the wayfarer and what your right hands possess. Indeed, God loves not the arrogant and the vain glorious. So here again, um, we see a whole array of types of behaviors that or, or, or people, sorry, to whom we should do good. But the point is that we should do good. And then now we can move into, well, what does Ehsan mean? Fine, we have to do it. Quran says we have to do it. Um, so what does that mean? And for this, I actually, this is the one place where I pop over to Hadith uh, because I think that this Hadith is great. Um, and it's it goes right to the heart of the matter. So um, this is a very long hadith. I've only taken out this one this one line um, that Ihsan is worshiping Allah as if you could see him. And even if you cannot see him, knowing that he can see you. So um, I actually would like to, I'm going to stop the share here because I want to see you all. And, oh, well, I'm not going to stop the share. I'll do it this way. Because I am really interested in knowing what, you all get out of this particular hadith, this particular definition of Ihsan. Worshipping God as if you could see him, and even if you cannot see him, knowing that he can see you. What do you think this might have to do with the concept of doing good? And I know everyone's got their fasting brains on. <laughs> but and I have no I have no particular right answer, but I, I'm interested in seeing what you all think of this. Also, who, also, who the, who, oops, yeah, go sorry. ahead. No, unless somebody else had something to say. I thought I'd get the conversation going a bit, but sure. Um, you know, I think it's it's easy to believe you're doing good if you're if you're operating in a vacuum. But when you put this in the forefront that God is watching you, then you're doing good in a manner that is centrally focused on pleasing, pleasing God. Um, and so it's not just doing good to your neighbor for the sake of being good, but it's it's doing good because I know it seems a bit abstract and a bit redundant, but to me, it feels like you're actually being watched. So even if you are in private and you feel the urge to maybe not do something good, knowing that God is there, then would push you to do good, even if no one else can see you. Great. Any other thoughts on this? I think Chance had was going to say something, but I um I can speak if no one else. Chance, so, did you did you want to share something? Okay. Question is. Yeah, I um you know I I feel like objectively speaking, when when we're being watched, we tend to do a little bit we're a little bit more responsible. Um, you know, somebody, either people are going to judge us or people will think we're bad and, and, and so on. And so I think the idea that God can see you, even if you can't know God is seeing or God is watching, we then, we can, we we should then, the idea is that we'll then feel more accountable and more um, responsible to do the right thing. Uh, and it's, it, you know, I feel like my, one way, one way that I personally think about this is when I pray, even though my parents aren't telling me to pray anymore, or I read the Quran, or I fast, or I do these things, even though nobody's what nobody's telling me to do it anymore. By now, it's it's I'm I'm making the decision myself, um, and it's it, I I never rationalized it. Recently, I haven't been rationalizing it as God is watching. I should do this because God says so. But it's more like this is the right thing to do, or this is my I, part of my identity, and so on. So at some point, it stops becoming um, about God because I I don't like the idea of doing something because God said so, because it's, you know, you have to be afraid of God. Uh, but it, it does help to keep me more accountable. And I do like the accountability aspect of it. So. Yeah. I mean, I think that what I, one of the things that I get out of this and I think why it kind of strikes me is because it is encouraging, as I see it, it's encouraging me to, um, to, to look for the spirit of the rules and not just the letter of the rules, because um, I, I don't know why it, why it works like that for me. I, I can't probably put my finger on exactly what it is, but if we think of, um, you know, I guess 
the idea that, you know, when you feel like you are being, you know, seen over or watched, then you don't just do sort of the bare minimum, minimum, you know, you don't, it's the idea like, well, you could just give yours a cut. You could just give sort of like the bare minimum, but, but if you have the sense that, you know, you are accountable, that you are being watched, then you think more about, well, what does it mean to truly, you know, be charitable? And then you, you would be prompted to give more for some reason. That's how it works for me. Um, but uh, I think that this, that this hadith in any case is great because it does give a sort of a thought provoking yet direct definition of ihsan. Okay, I'm gonna hide you guys again and move forward. Oh, I guess there's two things. I, I, I want to say one thing. In Sufi thought, there is this idea of muraqaba, um, of like being watched over, but the way that they interpret it, which is so interesting, is that it's actually watching over yourself just as much. So muraqaba is this sort of accounting that one does of one's own actions on a regular basis. So you sort of take on the viewpoint of God and then look at yourself from the outside so that you can then say, well, you know, am I really doing what I, the best that I could be doing? Am I fulfilling the spirit of the rules and not just the letter of the rules? Am I just doing the bare minimum? How can I improve? So um, I like that idea of muraqaba and it comes from the same idea of, of being watched, but it becomes this sort of self-reflective um, way of understanding, which I think is is really, is really interesting. Okay, so now I will hide you. Okay, so, um, so moving forward. Oh, and I actually, my heading here is Ihsan, a spiritual awareness, because I think that this hadith really gets us more into a spiritual way of understanding what it means to, um, to do what God commands rather than a sort of rule focused way of thinking about that. So um, I thought that made sense to me. Okay, um, so now we need to ask, well, what does Ahsan mean? Um, sorry, I'll put this down here. So there are, uh, in this part of the of my presentation, I'm just going to sort of run over the big categories that are covered in the Quran. And these are the verses that most directly speak to those categories of Ahsan. Um, I'm happy to share this later on if anybody is interested. Um, but you know, we we can't necessarily look at all of the verses. I just I just put them there so that we can get a sense of how many verses are are there on these various topics. So um there are some verses that have general commands. We looked at a couple of those um, to do ihsan, um, but they don't go into a lot of details. So I call those the general injection, injunctions to Ihsan. And then there are verses that do actually cover a lot of ground. They, the, the, like the one that I um, read to you earlier, which says, you know, do good to the needy and the wayfarer and the neighbor who is near and the neighbor who is far and all, right? And your parents. So those are these comprehensive verses. So there are some verses in the Quran that are, that actually cover a lot of ground and there are others that just kind of say well you should do it but it, it remains sort of uh very brief um and now i'm adding the second category ihsan as generosity charity and alms or zakat so there are verses that and this is in no particular order although i tend to put the more important themes towards the beginning so probably one of the most important forms of ihsan in the Quran is generosity and just giving charity. Um, so again, there are some general verses and then there are some more comprehensive verses that outline, you know, who you should give to and so forth. Now, um, ethics and what we think of as like fiqh or the specific concrete rules, they do sort of bleed one into the other. We can't entirely separate them. Um, but, um, there are some verses that are very much like, you know, like the inheritance verses, which are like, give one eighth of this to this person and give one sixth of this to this person. Um, I don't regard those as so much ethics as sort of like these concrete rules. But when it comes to charity, there are verses that are sort of more general. They don't say how much exactly to give, but they say you should give to 
you know, to the needy or to the poor or to orphans. So that's a major form of ihsan. Um, there are also verses that refer to Ihsan specifically as protecting those who are weak and those who are vulnerable. Of course, we know that the Quran gives a lot of attention to orphans, but those aren't the, that's not the only type of um, weak or vulnerable people that are um, alluded to in the Quran. And then there is the idea of Ihsan as treating one's parents well. Um, that also receives actually a fair amount of attention in the Quran. We can see there's several verses there um, that talk about that. And then there's this large category um, that I kind of collect as into the idea of ihsan in speech, right? There are all sorts of ways that we can do good simply by how we speak. And conversely, there is a lot of harm that we can do by how we speak. Um, and so uh, some of the more specific ways that the Quran speaks about ihsan and speech. And here, you know, I say on the on, in the main heading here, um, this idea of truthfulness. Oh, I can't do that because this is not the actual PowerPoint. This is the Zoom slide. Um, so um, clearly at the top of the list is being truthful in one speech and not speaking falsehoods. Um, but there's also uh, attention in the Quran to being fair in one speech. So truthfulness and fair mindedness are not exactly the same thing. Um, so the Quran emphasizes um, truthfulness, fairness, also kindness, right? There's a lot of attention to being kind, not taunting people, not using slurs, there's emphasis on integrity, right? Not gossiping, not insinuating things, not spying, not being um, overly suspicious or casting or, or provoking suspicion um, about others. Uh, and so um, there's the idea of being kind to the other, to their face, and then being kind to others behind their back, right? So that's how I distinguish a little bit between um, the, or there's like these two these two forms, right? So one can be very kind to another person to their face, but then be very cruel to them behind their back. The Quran um, addresses both of those um, and gives us instruction on how to on how to behave well. So this is a huge category that the Quran emphasizes, and we know most of us from our personal lives just how much damage can be done to speech that is either um, untrue, unfair, or unkind. And then the Quran also defines or describes ihsan when it comes to the use of monies. So, you know, fair dealings, not engaging in fraudulent conduct, not um, engaging in usury, not misappropriating, misappropriating funds. And I put theft in there as well. Now, you might be wondering, well, you know, why does... Why, why is Dr. Azam, or you can just call me Hannah, why is she, um, you know, putting these particular topics under Ihsan? Because if one were to um, look at the language that the Quran uses in many of these cases, there is actually um, use of some form of this word of Hasana, Ahsana, Ihsan, something like that. Um, muhsin, like those who do good. Uh, so there's oftentimes a linguistic um, connection in the Quran between the concept of ihsan and these particular types of conduct. And then the Quran talks about ihsan um, as preserving life. And interestingly, which is something we don't always think about, is ihsan in meeting out punishments. So even punishment, it has to be done within a larger framework of doing good. Um, I put into a different color here. This uh, it's these con these ideas of autonomy, equality, and privacy because they don't actually these ones don't actually 
they are addressed in the Quran, but not sort of within, we're using the language of, of Ihsan. Uh, so I didn't exactly know where to put them in, but I do think that they are important um, principles that are in the Quran as well that have to do with ethics. So, you know, the idea of, of an essential equality of persons is described, um, freedom of religion or, you know, sort of a, a, a mandate against religious coercion, um, emphasis on freeing bondsmen or freeing slaves, um, which most of us have encountered at some point or not in the Quran, and then privacy, the, the right to privacy, particularly privacy of the home. So those are some of the large categories that the Quran um, includes when it comes to Ihsan. Now, the other large concept that I told you I would talk about today is justice. And um, there's a way for me to make it even smaller. I can't, I think that's the best I can do. Um, so as I mentioned, um, what we call justice is covered through two terms in the Quran. Um, adil or adala and qist. And so um, generally speaking, um, these include the idea of balance um, and the opposite of adala or qist is injustice or oppression or tyranny. Those are some English words that can be used to translate um, these two words that I've put here, zulm and Bari. So again, if you're an Arabic or Urdu speaker, you might recognize these words. Zulm um, is quite common, Bari maybe not so much in, in Urdu. Um, but um, so the Quran speaks not only in favor of Adala and Qist, but also against Zulm. It comes up in the Quran quite a, quite a lot. And that's the reason why those who look at the sort of the ethical discourse of the Quran always emphasize the Quranic uh, focus on justice because it really is a very prominent theme. So um, there are, as we did with Ihsan, there are general verses that enjoin um, justice. And there's, uh, as you can see, many verses that I categorize as general injunctions. And then there are specific types of justice that the Quran emphasizes. So one of those is economic justice. Um, so there's there's doing good and then there's being just. And I think an interesting conversation can be had about well, what is the relationship? How are those two distinct? How are they how are they similar? What's the overlap between them? But in terms of the language that the Quran uses, um, it does use the language of adala and qist when it comes to certain economic relations. So there's an emphasis on economic justice. There's an emphasis on procedural justice. Maybe I should like pop out here because I, I, I want to um, ask if I think when we use the term economic justice, most of us know what we're talking about. But when we're talking about procedural justice, any thoughts on what that might mean? I don't know if there's any lawyers in the room. Are there any lawyers? Shadi, are you a lawyer? No. Not at all. <laughs> um, any ideas on what we might mean by procedural justice? Procedures that are followed to get somebody, to try somebody, like the presumption of innocence? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, any other examples of procedural justice or legal procedure that I mean specifically with the Quran is are we talking about like the wit no, I, she said did she, did it doesn't have to be no it doesn't have to be with the Quran just examples of it so we understand what we what what I mean by the concept of procedural justice you were about to say something right I, I was I was just thinking of witnesses of due process. I mean, thinking of, of American legal terms, I guess, you know, Miranda rights, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. So, so, um, you know, the Quran does not only talk about, you know, what should be done or what is right and what is wrong, or, you know, what the, what the punishment or rewards might be for certain actions, either in this world or in the hereafter, but also um, how to, how to, uh, or the importance of um, 
making sure that the procedures are right, because of course it doesn't go into the kind of detail that we'd expect in a whole built out legal system. But there are some principles that have to do with evidence. Well, how do, how do, how do we pre present evidence? How do we make, how do we make sure that the judge is judging justly? Um, you know, uh, so those all have to do, those all are within the field of procedural justice. And so the Quran does talk about that as a type of justice as well. Um, and then, um, yeah, so I have verses that I'll show you about those. Um, and then another area that has to do with, um, ethics is, uh, which I don't have time to go into certainly today. I, maybe I might have time to do this on the next, um, presentation, but, uh, there is a whole, aside from language of justice, and doing good, there is a lot of language in the Quran that has to do with virtue, um, how to be a good person. So I, you know, we can think of like, um, of ethics as what to do and what not to do. So, you know, you know, give charity, um, act justly, you know, preserve life. Okay. Those are those are uh, instructions on what to do or what not to do. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't steal. Okay. Don't murder. Okay. So those are do's and don'ts. Um, they still are ethical rather than sort of legal. They're not nitty gritty. They're general principles. They're flexible. They can be adapted to different situations. They're easier to remember and to act by um, in terms of like living religion. Uh, but akhlaq is different because it is focused not on what to do, but on how to be. So virtue has to do with a, a, the inculcation of certain values within the self and, um, and sort of walking, you know, in the world with those embedded in oneself. So Shanaz, you gave like the really good example um, of how, you know, oftentimes when you're, when you're, you know, engaging in prayer or fasting, you're not, um, you're not thinking about, well, you know, God is telling me to do this or, you know, not to do that. It's just, it, it's, it's become something of how you think you should be in the world. Right. And I think, you know, that's sort of the, the, the ideal in many ways when we can sort of, um, integrate, ethical principles into ourselves. So they just become part of how we are. Um, like we remember Allah, we are truthful people. We don't steal. So, um, so there is language in the Quran, actually a lot. This is just some, this is just a small example of some of the uh, virtues that are emphasized in the Quran that are sort of a, a, like the, the, the counter, not the counterpoint, but they help to fill out this picture of ethical discourse in the Quran. So there's emphasis on being humil on, on being humble, on practicing self-restraint, on being somebody that has integrity, on being a forgiving person, somebody who seeks peace between people, on being a, a, a person who acts in moderation and not being wasteful or profligate. Um, on being somebody who acts in a chaste manner, who acts in a modest and carries oneself in a modest manner. So these are not rules about what to do in a particular situation with a particular other. These are values or virtues that we inculcate within ourselves, that we should inculcate within ourselves. And then they carry through in, you know, in, in, in all of our in all of our dealings you don't need a rule for this if you are somebody who is who has inculcated humility in yourself then you don't need a rule to say well what should you do in every single situation the quran cannot give a rule the sunnah cannot give a rule we cannot cannot, cannot expect rules for every single moment of our lives but we can sort of have a general um trait of humility um that then make helps us to arrive at ihsan and justice in our specific dealings with others
I hope that sort of makes sense. So you can think of a clock as sort of like the personal individual grounding groundwork that allows or enables a person to act with ihsan and justice in one's dealings with others. Any any thoughts or questions or reflections so far before I move into Sadia? Nice to be nice of you to join us. Um, before I move into sort of the next part, I'd be interested in hearing what you all are thinking. As I'm listening, you know, I'm I'm a visual person, and so I sort of imagine like a pyramid, where at at the pinnacle of that pyramid is Ehsan, right? The sort of abstract command to do good. And then below that are, are these virtues maybe that you've listed here. And then below that are some of the um, the functions, right? The prayer, the, the zakat that kind of act as your base in order to build up. So when, you, when you're doing your zakat, when you are doing your prayers, it's keeping you maybe within some guardrails, right? That feed into your akhlaq. Right. And then your akhlaq will then feed into, you know, acting in a manner of ihsan in the way that God is as prescribed. So I really appreciate sort of how you have kind of deconstructed these uh, because I'm I'm gaining a, a visual understanding of this. And it just it it's very, very beneficial. So thank you. Oh, well, I actually really love what you just said, because I I think that's perfect. Right. Um, that. Uh... The prayer, for example, or these rituals, they, they are meant to help us acquire these qualities. And then those qualities, once they are, the, to the extent that we establish them in ourselves, help us then to do good, right? So I, I actually really like that. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, Tanya, would you, do you want to share a, a thought? Is that, is that Tanya or Summer? Um or Sadia, anybody else want to? Wait, Shadia, is that is that Al Ather? Ather? Yeah, it's it's Uncle Al. Yeah, it's Tanya's dad. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah. Hey, to... Tina, um, I'm I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get my kid out the door. He has a soccer <laughs> game, so excuse me. So I'm I'm that's why I, I'm I I haven't been participating as much, but um. But just give me five minutes and I'm going to get this kid out the door and then <laughs> I'll sure. be a little bit more attentive. Okay. Sure. I just want to, you know, see um, chance. You want to share your, your thoughts. I'd be really interested in hearing kind of what you're thinking um, at this point. Uh, when I see dress, uh, I visualize my daughter. She's been wearing a lot of pants lately. So, you know, I brought her some dresses. That's all I can emphasize on right now. There's so many different things on there I can just visualize, but that's the first thing that comes to mind. Dana, have any thoughts? Just thinking of how many finer points they are to being a good person, right? There's so many dimensions, so many things that we are mindful of at times and then unmindful of other things. And we tend to gravitate towards the things that we're more comfortable with and some things fall under our radar is what I'm thinking for myself. And how having a list like this or seeing them all together is really helpful in kind of evaluating myself is that where, what things am I mindful of? What things am I not thinking of and how I could do better? Thank you. Yeah, it's lovely to hear what you all are thinking. And I think, um, yeah, Shanaz, go ahead. That's a really good observation. I mean, it really it's it's really wonderful to have this visual of how many, and I'm sure these are not the only verses, right. um, but like humility and self-restraint, right? We get like all of those verses, integrity, forgiveness, and reconciliation. That's a lot of verses. Moderation, chastity, but then like in practice, which one of, the, how many people emphasize forgiveness? Like, like in our everyday practice of Islam, how many folks focus on humility and self-restraint, integrity, but a lot of us talk about um you know, chastity or modesty in, in dress, and it's usually gendered, of course, so women have to deal with that more. Um, but this is, this 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 list helps, the I guess, the number of times or some of the number of times that these themes appear, that's really helpful. Um, 
to like what is important to the Quran and what is important to us. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think when, one of the things that I think is so um, helpful that has been helpful to me and sort of actually like doing this is to, uh, you know, I mean, um, this is kind of outside of the scope of this, but it's just like a larger contextual reflection is that as minorities, as Muslims, like in the West um, or in this, in, in the U S particularly with the discourse around Islam, um, it's, it's 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 easy sometimes to forget how much um islam really has to offer and how much the quran has to offer to modern society to the world that we live in like today right now um and i think it um really helps to co collect these ideas and to really understand that these are rules for living that can be helpful to and that are good for any society that are admirable that are these really uh, positive um contributions to the human the human endeavor to be good in the world um, that can resonate with people across the board regardless of even what religion they are um, so yeah I think they're they're very thought-provoking and powerful okay I'm gonna just make minimize you guys again um, okay so now I'm going to look at some of the specific verses. I've listed a whole bunch of them, but now I want to actually stop and look at them some more um, and look at uh, the ones that have to do with Ihsan to begin with. So remember we did Ihsan and then we did justice. So look at this, starting with Ihsan. So um, it's always nice when other people read. So would somebody like to um, read this verse uh, aloud, please, on generosity and charity? I can go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. Those who in charity spend of their goods by night and by day in secret and in public have their reward with their Lord. On them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. Okay. It was, who was that actually? I couldn't see who was reading that. That's Tanya. Oh, Tanya, do you, do you want to just like, um, sort of, since you just read it, just, um, sort of give a thought on like sort of, uh, like to rephrase it in your own words, like what do you, what you see as sort of the the point here. Um. Yeah. I mean, I think. Um, uh, the way I interpret this, you know, we are. I think what we've been thinking about as charity is far more. Um. It, the, what what we've con what we have conceived as charity in present day life is very narrow uh, compared to what I, I believe the Quran is talking about. So I think um, I think this is probably a pretty broad definition of charity. Mm -hmm. um, and but you know if if someone says, oh, this person is charitable, I think what we automatically think is well they give money, right? They give money for charity. Um, or maybe they might devote their selves to helping others. But it's, I think, I feel like this particular sentiment and maybe is the Islamic idea of charity in general is more broad, even to the extent of, okay, well, I'm just going to help this person or say a kind word to this person or, you know, all of these things could be construed as charity is my feeling. But I would love to hear what you think about yeah. that. Yeah, well, um, I I think the the in secret and in public is is going back to this uh, hadith that I introduced earlier, right? E even if you can't see Allah, knowing that He can see you, right? So, what would what would? Of course, when we're in a fundraiser and the person at the front is saying, you know, who would like to contribute money to this cause, and we say yes, then you know everyone can see it, and you know there's there's a kind of social ego reward that goes with that but what is it that prompts um a muslim a person of faith to give um you know in secret this by night and by day so continually even when no one is seeing them it's ihsan it's that sense of ihsan right that um that prompts a person to do it even when no one else can see because only allah can see Right. And and so um, I, I think this one ties back 
not only it, it makes sense that this injunction or this encouragement to be generous and charitable is a reflection of the Ihsan principle. Here's another um, verse on uh, generosity and charity. This is a long one, um, but it, again, really beautiful because it's so comprehensive. Um, so would anybody like to read this one out loud? You're going to make me do it? Okay, I'll do it. Um, it is not righteousness that you turn your faces toward the East or the West. Rather, it is righteousness to believe in God in the last day, the angels, the book, and the messengers, to spend of your substance out of love for him, for your kin, for orphans, for the needy, for the wayfarer, for those who ask, and for the ransom of slaves, to be steadfast in prayer and practice regular charity, to fulfill the contracts which you have made, and to be firm and patient in suffering and adversity and throughout all periods of panic. Such are the people of truth, the God-fearing. Isn't this just great? I just, these verses are just like you, every time I encounter them, they're just like so, uh, so powerful. So I want to hear one thought from one of you, like, uh, Again, we're looking specifically at what the Quran says on charity, even though there's so many other principles in here. Any reflections on um, the part that I've underlined here? I guess you can reflect on any part of it. It's fine. I just It's a chance for us to reflect on Quran, which is always good. I think that the, the beginning, it's, that the, it's not righteous that you turn your faces towards the East or the West. So... We, I know Muslims who, when they pray, they're like, they're like, oh my God, my qibla is in the right direction. And they, they almost, I think the first part is suggesting you're missing the point if that's what you're thinking. Um, and so that's not what makes us righteous. It's not the, 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 the nitpicking, the, the, the tiny, tiny details of how to do things, but these general generic thing, all of this, you guys, like, this is pretty much what all religions do, right? Like all of them, all religions say, be kind, be generous, believing the religions would believe in God, believe in God, believe in the texts. Um, and that's what it means to be God-fearing. That's what it means to be truthful. And that's what it means to be a believer. And I, that's that's really beautiful, I think. This is a, I, I just made a note of this. I think I have it in my classes, but I just made a note of it to make sure to teach it in my classes. Um, yeah, it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful because, because of that. And this is Allah himself saying, I mean, of course, it is critical to do once a lot. We have to do it. But like Shadia, you were saying with, this, with your sort of pyramid structure that you sketched out for us, right? <clears throat> that's just that's just a foundation, right? It's supposed to. Um, it's not just it. It's that it, as challenging as it is to do our fasting and to do our prayers and to do all to do all to fulfill all, all of those things they are not actually the main point. They are meant to strengthen us so that we can see all of these other horizons and be able to aspire to them um, and inshallah be able to, to reach them. Um, and who could ever doubt, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier about what, the, what Islam can really contribute to the world, who could doubt that a society that is able to achieve these things wouldn't be a fabulous society, you know, one where we can, um, where we take care of our kin and our and the orphans and the needy, and um, and for those who ask, is that's so broad, right? Um, a person doesn't have to be of a particular category to to give. If somebody just comes and asks, and if you can respond to that in some way, even if it's a small, I don't have a lot to give, I can give something. Um, but then look at the other parts too, you know, it doesn't go to generosity, but fulfilling contracts, you know, having patience and adversity, there's adversity, there's so much here. Okay, I'll go to the next verse. Um, now, the Quran does not only tell us to give, it spells out ways to give. So there is an emphasis on the etiquette of charity, right? Um, 
So the first verse there, and render to the kindred their due rights, as also to those in want and to the wayfarer, the wayfarer. So we've been we've encountered those categories before, but do not squander your wealth in the manner of a spendthrift. So there has to be sort of moderation in giving, um, right? So you don't you don't want to just sort of give everything, because number one that can there's all sorts of problems with being careless or, 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 you know, you can't just throw money at all problems, right? Some problems need actual thought. You have, you, you have to figure out what the problem is and try to address it. Um, and then the second one is just beautiful. Kind words and the covering of faults are better than charity followed by injury. And so there's an etiquette there that, um, my gosh, if you're going to give, and then you're just going to keep on waving it in the person's face. Like, do you remember that time I gave you? Do you remember that time I helped you? Do you remember that time that, I, you know, like, well, you know, if anybody's ever been on the receiving end of that, it's like, my God, I wish you had never helped me <laughs> because you've made it like, you know, you've made me feel worse by, by, by reminding me or, or by making me feel low. Right. Um, so in a situation like that, isn't that something kind words, and simply simply covering the faults of others. Did that strike anybody? Shadia, what are you thinking on that one? Oh my gosh. I mean, that's a charity in itself because that can change the path of a person. You know, someone whether it's intentional or or a mistake, a fault is a fault. And if you are to cover it up and prevent others from hearing it that can either realign that person that can prevent them from going down a path that is destructive, either self-destructive or communally destructive. Uh, there's just so, there's so much in covering the fault of others. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not something we talk about a lot, right? It's one of those overlooked topics, forgiveness and covering the fault of others. I feel like we don't or um, reconciliation in the previous slide, I was thinking it's, these are things that we don't talk about a lot and we should. I've also been thinking a lot about when in the Quran, something is treated as a, an obligation versus a mere recommendation. And I'm getting the, like, I feel like the, in the way that I, that people around me at least practice Islam is pretty much everything that comes to women, that is an obligation. But everything else is simply treated as a recommendation. So it's good to not squander your wealth. It's good to give orphans their rights. It's good to do all of these things, but it's an obligatory thing for, you know, let's say, a woman to do this or for a man to, it's seldom for a man to do the, the men are seldom treated as, except for the whole being providers. But, um, but this, like, the, but, but given that oftentimes the Quran sort of uses the same kind of language or because mm -hmm. it's always clear right like when something is this is fard on you this is mandatory um but it, it, it but i've been thinking a lot about when we decide something is simply a guideline to follow it's a recommendation and when it's an obligation like in the quran when it says that um a man should uh, pay his wife for breastfeeding their child like that's not treated as an as, as an obligation on the man right as on, on the father but um something like how women should cover, right? That is treated, that is viewed as an obligation on women. So it's it's really fascinating to me when it comes to things that actually have an impact on other people, I feel like that would make sense to treat as obligations. We need to be, it should be an obligation to be kind to people, to give people their due rights and to, um, you know, to be mindful of other people, but that's not how we do things, I feel like. Yeah, no, yeah no. I think. Go ahead, Tanya. I'm just going to add to that. I think um, what is what is emphasized by scholars and I guess the community at large is um, some of those nitpicky things that you were talking about and not the bigger picture stuff, right? And it, it almost feels like the wrong things, right? Like, oh well, my it gosh. Because yeah. it, it can also make a person feel bad. I mean, I think that that's a place where you can literally have two conflicting principles like if you know if one is you know we might see somebody who's maybe not um practicing the way that we think that they they should maybe they're new to the religion maybe they come from a different background maybe they have different they're focusing their attention their efforts on different areas of self-improvement or you know they have a different 
understanding of, of a particular rule. Um, in a place like that, you know, you have a choice. Do you tell them what you think that they should be doing and correct them? Or do you kind of go with the kind words and covering a false route, right? Um, they they literally clash right into each other. And so, yeah. They, yeah, maybe. but I but I feel like, uh, yeah. So to that point and what Shanaz was saying and, and Zainab, um, I think the emphasis is just... It, I feel on things that are just are not simply as important, you know, like, well, make sure that not one strand of hair is showing when you say namaz because God forbid, you know, or, you know, just like, like little kind of very nitpicky, like who even cares kind of stuff. Um, as opposed to the bigger umbrella of a son that you've been emphasizing. And all the things that fall underneath it. So I, I, have a... I want to say, Shanaz, thank you so much. Shanaz had to leave. We couldn't even say goodbye to her. Um, yeah. Oh, Shadi, I'm glad you were able to respond. Yes. I had a quick question on this. Assalamu <clears throat> alaikum. Good to see you. Um, so <laughs> this is Sadia through me. Oh, there uh, you are. Yeah. I know. I'm not camera ready by any means. Um, <laughs> so. What I was going to ask is, I mean, to the points that were just discussed, I have to question, like, is it because of visibility? Like, is it because whether someone's wearing hijab or not is a visible thing? So people just like latch on to that versus someone's, you know, intentions or hidden good deeds or deeds that are done, you know, not even hidden, but. I didn't see somebody doing something, so I'm not aware of it. Is that why we're so focused on these nitpicky things, as Shana's put it? Um, or and also because the I, the example that popped into my head while y'all were talking is <laughs> I swear the next time a masjid auntie is like criticizing someone for wearing nail polish, it's just like, come on, lady, look at the fact that the person who came to the masjid is standing in line for prayer. But you're going to sit there and focus on the fact that the woman's wearing nail polish. Um, so I just, I'm, that made me like processing that question made me think like maybe we're just programmed to focus on the visible things. Yeah, I think that's such a great observation, Sadia. I mean, clearly um, we can only judge each other on what we can perceive, right? And there's things that we we simply can't perceive um and so yeah it's it's probably natural um it's also easier when things are really concrete right you know like how do you assess another person's covering a fault qual you know like level you know um versus their you know you know their i don't know number of missed prayers level it's some things are more concrete than other or versus something that you can fit the beard length level you know um so I, I think you're i think you're right and i think that's that's why it's so important for us to remember that in the eyes of allah these things are just as important e even if even if in the eyes of the world certain outward things are easier to gauge or criticize or praise from the divine perspective, these interior things, these things that are not so easy to measure are just as important. And then our third verse, um, those who spend their substance in the cause of God and follow not their gifts with reminders of their generosity or with injury, for them, their, their reward is with their Lord. On them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. So this is the same sort of theme um, that we just saw earlier. Um, so if there's one thing that we can maybe take away from this page is that when we do, when we are in a position to give to others, to try to not think of it as a trade, you know, sometimes we think of like, well, I I invited this person to iftar. I invited them to my house and 
Look, they came for iftar. And look, they only brought like a small box of cookies. And there were like 50 people here. I'm 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 exaggerating. I don't know who has room for 50 people in their house. But I had all these people and I cooked all this biryani and I made a kebabs and all this kind of stuff. And this person walked in the door with a small box of cookies. And and on top of that, I invite them every year and they never invite me to their iftar. What you know? So do you see what's happening there? Something that could be an opportunity to receive hasanat, right? To receive reward from Allah. We've turned it into a trade. Like, how come they're not giving me the right amount back? Um, so having that mindset will inevitably lead a person to saying something. Something is going to show their disgruntlement. Either they're going to say something to that person's face. Inevitably, they're like something will slip out. And then they've got the charity followed by injury. Or they'll say something to somebody else. Oh, yeah. You're going to invite that person will just, you better get extra food ready because they always come and eat a whole lot and they only bring a little bag of chips, you know? So, um, you know, then, then we're lead it, then we're led into another sin, which is the backbiting sin, right? So it's tricky. It takes a tremendous amount of self-awareness to like really put these into practice. These are, they seem easy, but they're kind of really hard to, to do. And they're really deep. Okay. So um, let's move to the next slide. And I'm, oh, we have 20 more minutes, but Sadia, I've sort of just been taking Q&A sort of as we go, right? So I don't need to like pause specifically for Q&A, right? I sort of keep on moving. Yeah, you have your, this is great. This is perfect. This space. Okay. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so more on the ethics and etiquette of charity. O ye of faith. Do not cancel your charity by reminders of your generosity or by injury, like those who spend their substance to be seen of men, but believe not in God or the last day. They are imperable like a hard, barren rock on which is a little soil. It, on it falls heavy rain, which leaves it just a bare stone. They will be able to, to do nothing with what they have earned, and God guides those who do not reject faith. And guide God, God guides not those who reject faith. So, okay, by this point, I've introduced three verses on the same topic. I mean, this is like, there are more verses on this topic than there are on some other verses that people give a lot more attention to. You know, think think of a topic that you see people giving, uh, like one of the more concrete types of rules that people give a lot of attention to that maybe are introduced once in the Quran. And then here you have so many verses on generosity, not only on generosity and charity, but on how to do it right, right? Um, so any any thoughts on this parable? The hard barren rock with the little bit of soil parable. What is the what is the rain representing in this in this metaphor? What is the rock? What do you guys make of it? And I, by the way, I want to say this. Anybody who would say that the Quran does not use symbolic language needs to read more Quran. Because there is a lot of symbolic, like really beautiful figurative language in the Quran that really makes a person think and that you have to sort of interpret. Roshi's usually really good at interpreting these things, but I think she's pretty, been pretty quiet. I like to. I always like to call on Roshi because she's pretty wise. Roshnara, would you like to say something? And I, I, yeah, Go no. ahead. yeah. Whenever rain is mentioned, I always think of it as a revelation. Uh, something I learned from, like uh, something I've learned that it's similar symbolism exists in other religions too like buddhism i've learned like rain is usually very symbolic of um, um, inspiration and gen revelation so that's what i see here like the rock might be your heart <laughs> i don't know i'm just 
because Chadia called me out. I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, if you know, um, oftentimes rain in the Quran is also um, it, it represents the blessings of Allah, all the good things that God gives us. So if we imagine along those lines, yes, Zainab. Please finish what you were saying. Well, no, no. I don't want to say if, if, if that's what you were going to say. Well, I was just thinking as, as we were reading these verses is that every person has a capacity to do things, right? And, and knowing our own capacity and reminding of that beautiful hadith that those who know themselves know God. So I feel like problems arise when we're doing something which, which is more than our capacity at that time, and then it's backfiring on us. So I think the rock here refers to that is that you don't really have the capacity to do this deed or you haven't cultivated the right mindset for it, but you're going ahead and doing it. And so it's not going to end well or you will end up canceling what you're doing. And so I think tying it back to, you know, the prayer and all of that is supposed to help us develop our capacity to, for doing good, like developing the right mindset or that the right awareness of God that helps us to do things. I know in my life, uh, things that I do often backfire. There's a saying in Urdu, Neki Barbad Guna Lazim, like you, you were out to do something good, but it ended up backfiring. So I'm maybe a PhD in backfiring. And when mm -hmm. I analyze that, I just feel like it goes back to what was my capacity or where was I coming from? Did I set up myself in the right way? Or did I just rush ahead impulsively to do what I was going to do? And then, so I think the Quran is also diverting our attention towards that. Yeah, that intentionality and that sort of spiritual place from which our actions come, definitely. You know, um, if we think of the, if we think of the, like looking at the, the parable all the way through, right? Um, you know, I'm the rock. Okay. I have done some good deeds. I've, I've done some generosity. That's the soil. I've like, I've like, I've, I've collected, a, I've, I've managed to create a little bit of soil on this bare rock. You know, it, can anything grow on it? We don't know, but there's like a little bit of soil on, on, on this rock. Um, and, um, and as soon as like, there's, you know, some sort of a, um, a challenge, something that's difficult. I'm reading the heavy rain in a different way here. Um, something that's actually sort of like overwhelming. Um, it sort of wipes away that sort of um, that goodwill that I had built up, that the hasanat that I'd built up the soil and it just wipes it away. And I'm not able to sort of like, yeah, like kind of like what you're saying, Zainab, like I'm not able to sort of withstand the onslaught and actually continue to behave well. So I, I'm not able to do anything with what I've earned, right? Like I've not, I'm not able to um, kind of keep a, keep a, a, a fruitful, he healthy, productive sort of stance in the situation that I'm in. But I certainly think there's a lot to be, a lot to think about with these parables. One has to really kind of keep thinking about them and reflecting on them because there's, there's wisdom that we are supposed to uh, arrive at that that just take effort to think about. Okay, um, so moving ahead. Okay, so so we just covered a whole series of verses that define that look at ihsan as charitable giving and as generosity. Now we're moving to a different way of doing ihsan that the Quran outlines. This is caring for the weak and, and the vulnerable. Right. Um, so we'll start with a verse about um, orphans, which um, and or those who are I, I have to say here, when we use the word orphan in English, we have a kind of specific meaning right where we mean a child whose uh, both parents have died. That is um, a very narrow construction of orphans and orphans in um, in Arabia at the time, the term was a was broader. Um, it had to, it it was somebody who whose parents had died, a child whose parents had died. But it also has to do with or could be referred to a person who's who doesn't have kin, 
right? They, they just don't have, they don't have blood relatives or close enough blood relatives um, who can, who can protect them. Um, children who are without protection, essentially, they don't have family to protect them. So um, in a, in an instance like that, they might, um, they might have somebody else like a ward who is handling their finances until they come of age. So this verse has to do with that. So let those disposing of an estate, like, you know, I'm, I'm a ward of a child. I'm the state, I'm the city, I'm the court. I'm, a, I'm an appointed person. I'm supposed to be sort of like um, taking care of this child and I have access to their estate while they're a minor. Let those disposing of, of an estate have the same fear in their minds as they would have for their own, like their own children, if they had left a helpless family behind. Let them fear God and speak words appropriate. Those who unjustly eat up the property of orphans eat up a fire into their own bodies. They will soon be enduring a blazing fire. So the Quran, um, it, at the top of its list of, this is something that has really struck me very recently. At the top of the Quran's list of vulnerable categories are children, orphans. And I was recently kind of struck by the fact that I think this is the single largest gap in Muslim charitable work. If you think of, even try to think of, um, you know how like even in Austin, there are homes for children who are you know, who've been removed from their parents or maybe who don't have parents, this, 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 you know, so many homes for, for, for minors, children who've run away. Like Muslims are completely absent of that space. We don't do anything, almost anything. I don't know of too much that Muslims are doing for orphans in our society. What would be kind of, you know, the equivalent of orphans in our society, basically youth, minors, who are with homeless. Um, I think it's like a, a, a major gap. And it's it's remarkable considering how much money we give to the building of Masajid, how much money we give to, I mean, we give money to a lot of different things. And sometimes we do give money to, <clears throat> you know, for, for the homeless, okay, you know, there are some soup kitchens, there are some medical clinics that Muslims do run, which is all great. Um, but I think as a category, considering that it's such a critical category, it comes up in every cat every listing of zakat categories. I don't think that Muslims are we are not doing our job um, to take care of children who are vulnerable. Do you have any thoughts on why that is, Anna? Uh, you know, I think it's extremely difficult. I think that's one of it. It's, it's very difficult to open. Um, there's a term, and I, it's it's passing my mind right now. We used to have orphanages. Now they're not called orphanages. They're called, um, I, I forget what they're called. But it's challenging. You know, there's all sorts of legal complications. You're dealing with taking on the responsibility of of, of of people's lives but i think also part of it is that there's this idea that in islamic law you can't adopt has anybody ever encountered that idea yeah shadia what have you heard about that well we we adopted a little boy out of the texas foster care system almost wow, two years ago but you can imagine the comments that that we get well what are you going to do when he's older well, are you going to raise him a Muslim? Are you going to raise him, you know, a Christian? Are you, it's not permissible. I mean, right away, a lot of times we'll face this sort of thing. Oh, wow. Welcome to the family. It's, are you sure that's permissible? Not from my own family, but from extended family. Um, they're very worried. What's that? Oh, yes, yes. Well, what about the inheritance? So um, there's a lot of taboo, which is so sad because to your point, I mean, it is mentioned so often, take care of the orphans, take care of the orphans, take care of the foster children. And um, we've we've converted that emphasis in the Quran um, into this taboo topic that no one wants to really tackle. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it that is, that's remarkable, Shadia. First of all, mashallah, mashallah to you for taking a, in a foster child. But secondly, 
that instead of saying like, okay, you, you, you're, you're helping to save a life, you know? I mean, the, the situation for, I mean, the numbers of foster children in this country is insanely high. I think it's something around 900,000. Um, and it's only going to get higher because of the um, the various laws that are being passed that limit abortion. I'm not saying that I want to advocate for abortion, but um, the percentage of unwanted pregnancies that are now turning into actual births is only flooding the 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 foster system. So um, and those children are being passed from home to home to home to home. And, um, and many children end up in prostitution. They end up in drug dealing. They end up being abused. And so it is a major sin upon us that we are so, so silent and absent. Um, and uh, I think it's just, it, it's it's horrible that that's the common the type of comments that that you're that you're getting instead of saying wow you guys have done something really great is you know i can't tell tanya are you unmuted because you wanted to say something no i'm good i, I uh, i'm okay. fine yeah cool well i was just gonna say <clears throat> we my husband and i don't have kids and um have you know uh, explored adoption but i feel like it really comes back to the silly example I gave of the nail polish focus. People are so focused on like the nitpicky things about, um, I guess the thick, thick -y rules. Um, like, oh, you know, you're gonna have to nurse them if it's uh, to make it to make them a mahram. And there's just like people focus in on these details rather than the bigger picture. So going back to your whole point is like, we're looking at, um, we're missing the forest for the trees, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't want to try to push on right now because we are at the end of our time and we'll continue this next time. Um, but uh, I think it's a, it's kind of a, it's, it's an important place to stop because I did actually, um, I actually have thought about like, you know, if, like what what could what could we do about this? I've I've actually spoke with Sheikh Athiya about like from the mosque out in Brushy Creek, you know, <clears throat> like is there any like what would it take for I and I'm again I'm so annoyed that I can't remember the term for the types of um the types of homes. The they're not called I'm not talking about foster homes like individual homes, but like the group homes um that are run by churches and and like there's there's various ones like that. Like what would it take? for for the Muslim community to start something like that um because yeah I think it's just a it's a major it's a major oversight what did you uh what was the feedback you got from the um from the leaders of the masjids I, yeah I only talked to one I only talked to one imam about it and um I think it's, or maybe I talked to two. I may have also mentioned it to Sheikh Anwar at, at Noises. I'm not sure. But um, at least I think it's really so remote from the minds. I, I just don't even think that they're, I, I have actually never heard an imam ever actually talk about this. I just don't think that they're thinking about it. Chance, have you ever heard any, any kind of like, like real discussion about what, what Muslims should be doing to fulfill this obligation towards orphans in, 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 in our society? No, I've never been on that subject. Yeah, I think that, um, or Harris, I, I, if you would like to speak up, but I, I just don't, the response that I remember getting was like, what? Like, like, I don't know. Like there was just no thought about it. Now, I think you guys are hitting on a very important thing. This has been a blind spot, and, and I don't know where this comes from, because clearly the injunctions are uh, filled in the Quran on this obligation, and we have multiple examples from the time of the Prophet and his companions who 
did that. And it was necessary at that time. And it was more visible, perhaps because it has become invisible and the complications of adoption that, that Shadi has spoke about, the legal aspects here. Um, but yeah, this, is, this is a very good call out from you all. And in, in times like this, um, you know, we become empty nesters and dear God is making me think that we have no, um, there's no, uh, no reason why we can't consider an option like this. So Jazakallah for uh, shining a light on this. Thank you, Harris. I mean, I, I would love to see the, the ability. I, I understand that sometimes people may not want or be able to um, adopt a child or foster a child in their home, but I would love to see Muslims construct and uh, and operate a really good um like a really good home for for children in 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 Austin and you know have something that's just a good nicely run facility with caring staff and you know that that offers stability and safety and um yeah be, it really it will really, because we all we also know this and Sh Shadi I'm sure you know this very well the older children get the chances of adoption just plummet like you know everybody wants a child did you know that aside from the fact that there are 900,000 something maybe nine, 900 to 950,000 children um in and I and if I if my statistics are wrong please forgive me it has been some time since I've looked into that to this um aside from the hundreds of thousands of children who are in the foster care system right now, there is, because of plummeting fertility in the United States, a lot of families are adopting, but they don't want children that are older than like two or three. So what they're doing is they're actually adopting children from other countries because they would rather have a baby or an infant or a toddler from another country than have a child who's older in our country. And so we, it's one of the strange facts of life that people age. What, what does a child do? They're born, they're a, a baby, they're a toddler, that somehow they end up out of their homes. And, um, and the next thing they know, they're eight or nine or 10 years old, their chances are gone. Their chances are almost gone. Um, so I would love I would love it if you know if we if we even could begin thinking about the question realize that there's a problem and that is that we as Muslims should be doing something about it so I will leave you all with that hopefully thought so much thought. I just had one final comment is thinking very fondly of our recently passed Shabana Stationwala board member founding member of Muslim Space. She was the one who led the foster care event mm. um, in the Muslim community and really encouraged. And Sheikh Omar, another person of blessed memory, very fondly remembered and missed. He was the speaker on that. So I just remember these two people as caring about this issue and coming and speaking up and planning for it and encouraging others towards it. May Allah grant their souls the highest level of Jannah and help us to follow in their footsteps. I mean, do you know if anything came of, of those efforts? Shadia, it was soon after that you <laughs> became a foster parent. Did that help you? Um, it, Between that, well, I think I already had my eyes set on at least just getting licensed. There was a, another awesome. sister, and, and, and mm -hmm. Hinnam, you might know Fidelma. You probably know Fidelma. Yeah. Yes. Fidelma yeah. adopted two, two children out of foster care, and I think that was a bit of a motivator for us, at least to get licensed. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'll just say, Adoption isn't the only opportunity that that Muslims yes. can participate in, and even taking in a child, and like you said, Hannah, with foster, there are so many other ways. And I can tell you, the only way that we were able to, you know, take in a child as a as a foster child was because I had a network of friends who helped, you know, um, who got um approval to be respite providers babysitters to give us a break um it really does take a community so it's not enough for one or two families to get licensed to your point it needs to be a community-led effort and it can Absolutely. be a group home it can be offering resources for 
um, children in care, for foster families, for birth parents who are trying to get their, their kids back. They need more help than anybody else. Um, and so I think we could absolutely be vanguards for efforts like that. But so thank you um, for bringing this issue up. Yeah. And, and that reminds me of um, one of the things that I thought would be more more accessible for Muslims, like all Muslims to do, is if we could partner with maybe a couple of the existing group homes. They really need, I actually con did contact a couple of them as well, one that was here on the north side in particular. Um they really need people to come in and help with things. So like if, if, you know, if people could come in and say, okay, uh, and volunteer to help with homework, to help with activities, to help clean up um, and children need stability. So they really need to see the same faces over and over again, you know? So like it's, it, it, if, if, if we say like, okay, we're going to make a commitment and I'm going to come in, you know, you know, once or twice a month and I'm going to help over here the kids get to know you and you know um it it helps with their mental health it gives them people to connect with and bond with emotionally so and that does not mean you have to take a child into your home if you're not able to do that it's something where you can go and, and give something so maybe that's one good thing that would might come out of these um these discussions inshallah so I think yeah you know, and there's already a lot of organizations that are doing that like the um brother big brothers and sisters and stuff like that you know they're already existing right um, so we can just have so, to part be, yeah. participate right that's right yeah. yeah um okay so i thank you all so much for coming today i hope that it was beneficial and all the things that we covered um we will continue through next week inshallah and get through the remainder of the slides um, and if you know anybody who would like to join, it's okay. They can join late. They don't have to have been here today to to contribute and learn and benefit, inshallah. And thank you so much, um, Zainab and Shadia, for inviting me. No, this was fantastic. Zakallah, thank you. Um, enjoy the rest of your Saturday. And inshallah, like you said, we'll be back here next Saturday, same time, same place. But take care, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Assalamu alaikum.